This is The Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is Chris Abraham, Season 7, Episode 4. I do not know what this is about, but shout out to Jerome for convincing me that he likes my voice and my brain and my ideas and my rap enough that he encourages me and encouraged me to move forward. I have a friend, Mark, who has such a beautiful, amazing announcer voice that I am only hearing the squawking of a Canadian goose whenever I hear myself speak. But I guess in comparison to the adenoidal, adenoidal, adenoids, 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 aden, adenoidal uh, people on NPR and various and sundry podcasts, I have a gorgeous uh, uh, basso or tenor or whatnot. So... Today, I mean, there's a lot of things I can talk about. There's so many things I can talk about. I could talk about uh, Donald Trump having 34 felonies and what that means, uh, being a felon uh, presumptive nominee uh, for the Republicans. I could talk about Hunter Biden being convicted under three felonies for um, basically lying on a federal background check form when he was at the local gun shop and buying a, I believe, 45 caliber 1911. Um, maybe, I'm not sure. Might be a Glock 22, who knows? But I think it was 45 caliber. And how he was caught on that um, and how nobody gets busted for that unless it's in connected connection to other things. I could talk about how Trump's... Uh, Conviction, convictions, including uh, the um, sexual assault and defamement. I believe that all of those were uh, dead misdemeanors that have been timed and aged out of, but were revived in the perfect time, just reactivated by New York government uh, in order to make it possible to... um, to bring to charge Trump. I don't care how any of this stuff goes. I just believe that my clarion call is always to say that um, America and the world are at the precipice of populism. And that's another thing in the news uh, this week, which is um, president, is it president or president, um, what is his name? The French president, Macron, I, you know, he is dissolu- dis- dissoluting, dissolu- dis- dissolving uh, the, the parliament, or is it the European Union parliament? Is he dissolving or dissolu- dis- dis- dissolving the French parliament or government, or is he doing it with the EU? But whatever the case may be, the elections for the European parliament uh, completed and um, uh, France, Italy, and Germany have had record li- uh, record numbers uh, of uh, populace. They call them um, right wing or extremist right wing governments, but I just consider them to be uh, right wing populists. And what that means and how um, you know the last ten years uh, have been. A, an assortment of populist uprisings from Brexit to the 2016 elections to, um, is it Marine Le Pen? Le Pen? Le Pen? Le Pen? Marine or Marie? And uh, the French babe. And of course, there's Hungary and there's, um, there's threats of Poland becoming more conservative. We know that uh, Slovakia was airing more uh, conservative and populist. Poland was more populist, um, just all over the board. 
So, but instead of talking about all that fun, I am going to see if I can co-host my podcast with um, ChatGPT 4.0. So we'll see what happens. I am going to put on, uh, there we are. All right, let's see if we can do this. We're connecting. We'll see what happens. Anyway, uh, I am off my feet today and recording from, uh, from my bedroom because I've been doing a lot of spinning. And yesterday I rode my bike to the spin uh, club, Cycle Bar, Columbia Pike. And when I got off the bike, I pinched my lower back. I pinched a nerve on my lower back. And as a direct result, I am, I am unhappy uh, about it. It's saying that it has bad connectivity. Let's see if I can make it better by scanning for another one. So my lumbago, my lumbago, my lumbago. I am on four Advil, which I don't like to take. And uh, I just got off of a call and my client asked me why I wasn't at the Columbia Pike Library. And I said, it's because I've I've got a kink in my back and it's terrorizing me. And when you have a kink in your back, you need to take one of two paths. One path is to uh, relax, take some, uh, I don't know, some muscle relaxant type of painkiller like Advil and try to let the uh, pressure come off the nerve. The other way is to keep moving and hopefully you work it out. So I didn't do that one. Trying to connect again. We'll see. We'll see if I can get on there. If not, it'll just be me. Um, yeah, Jerome really thinks I do a good job. I don't, I haven't really been inspired to, uh, blog post or, uh, do any of this. Here we are. Hey there. Um, is this chat GPT 4.0? Hey, yes. This is chat GPT based on the GPT-4 architecture. How can I? Would you like to, uh, be on a podcast with me? I host a podcast called the Chris Abraham show. This is season seven episode four, and I'd really like you to be part of it. That sounds like a fun idea. While I can't physically join you on the podcast, I can definitely help you with ideas, questions, or content for your episode. What would you like to discuss on this episode of the Chris Abraham Show? Do you know anything about the um, parliamentary elections that are happening in the EU right now? The European Parliament elections took place from June 6th to June 9th, 2024. This election is significant as it is the first after Brexit and occurs every five years. The election saw voters across the 27 EU member states casting their votes to elect new members of the European Parliament, MEPs, who will influence key decisions and legislation within the EU for the next five years. Turnout was higher this year, with Eurobarometer data showing a significant increase in voter intention compared to previous years. The elections witnessed a notable shift towards the far right in several member states, including Germany, France, and Italy. Right-wing populist parties made significant gains, reflecting broader political trends across Europe. The election results will also play a crucial role in shaping the new European Commission, as the European Parliament votes to approve the new president of the European Commission and the entire College of Commissioners. Current European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen from the European People's Party, EPP, is aiming for a second term after her party secured the most seats. These elections are pivotal for the EU's future, affecting legislation, trade agreements, and the overall political landscape of Europe. For more detailed results and analysis, you can check sources like the European Union's official election site and recent news reports from DW and Politico. That's cool. Can you tell me, um, I, I don't know, are they right wing or are they right wing populist? Can you tell me What's going on with populism in Europe in the United States in 2024? In 2024, the rise of populism in Europe and the United States continues to shape political landscapes significantly. Populist movements, particularly on the right, have gained traction by appealing to voters' concerns over immigration, cultural changes, and distrust of traditional elites. These movements often combine nationalism with anti-immigration policies, creating a potent political force. In Europe, right-wing populist parties like France's National Rally, Germany's Alternative for Deutschland, AFD, and Italy's Brothers of Italy have made substantial electoral gains. 
These parties capitalize on anti-immigrant sentiment and concerns over national sovereignty, often positioning themselves against the perceived overreach of EU institutions. The trend in the United States mirrors this rise. Populist rhetoric has significantly influenced mainstream politics, particularly within the Republican Party. Issues such as border security, economic nationalism, and opposition to globalism resonate strongly with a significant portion of the electorate. This shift is evident in the continued influence of figures like Donald Trump and the policies endorsed by his followers. Economic instability, cultural anxieties, and a general mistrust of established political institutions drive this populist surge on both sides of the Atlantic. While the specific political contexts differ, the underlying dynamics of populism remain similar. A focus on reclaiming national identity, resisting globalization, and prioritizing domestic concerns over international cooperation. For more detailed insights, you can refer to comprehensive analyses by Brookings and the Migration Policy Institute, which explore these trends in depth. Um, can you tell me, has there been in the United States a kind of collaboration between what would be considered the extreme uh, left populist movement and the extreme right populist movement? Because I noticed things like Jimmy Dore and Tulsi Gabbard and, um, and, and Tim Pool and uh, other people who like um, uh, who tend to to have previously been thought of as leftists, uh, progressives, and leftist populists seem to be spending a lot of time on what is often considered right-wing conservative platforms such as Fox News or podcasts and that kind of thing. Do you think that um, left populism and right population populism in America are joining forces? Yes. There has indeed been a noticeable trend of collaboration or convergence between what are traditionally seen as extreme left and extreme right populist movements in the United States. This phenomenon is sometimes referred to as a red-brown alliance, named after the historical alliances between communists red and fascists brown. Figures like Jimmy Dore, Tulsi Gabbard, and Tim Pool, who have roots in leftist or progressive politics, have increasingly found common ground with right-wing populist platforms on certain issues. These collaborations often center around shared criticisms of neoliberal economic policies, government corruption, and the influence of corporate elites. While their ideological foundations may differ, the convergence is largely driven by mutual opposition to the political establishment and a shared desire to address perceived systemic injustices. The collaboration is particularly evident in media appearances and public discourse. For example, individuals from the left populist camp have frequently appeared on platforms traditionally associated with right-wing viewpoints, such as Fox News, to discuss these common concerns. This has led to a blending of messages and a broader appeal to a disenchanted populace across the political spectrum. While these collaborations might seem unusual, they reflect deeper discontents within the American political landscape where both left and right populists feel that traditional political parties do not adequately represent their interests or address their grievances. This convergence highlights the fluid and complex nature of modern populism, where alliances can form across traditional ideological divides to challenge the status quo. Do you think that the establishment Democrats and the establishment Republicans, traditional neocons and neoliberals, have a blind eye or a blind spot when it comes to not uh, realizing how aligned the populist left and the populist right are? And do you think that the newest uprisings against um, Israel, the pro-Palestine uprising is against Israel, and the uh, calling of our president Joe Biden, Genocide Joe, is a signifier of populism or a signifier of something else? Yes, there is a growing recognition that the traditional establishment within both the Democratic and Republican parties, often referred to as neocons and neoliberals, may have a blind spot when it comes to the alignment between populist left and right movement. These establishments often focus on maintaining the status quo and may underestimate the depth of dissatisfaction and the convergence of interests among populist groups. Populist movements from both sides are driven by anti-establishment sentiments and a shared frustration with economic inequality, corporate influence, and perceived governmental corruption. 
the collaboration between figures traditionally associated with leftist populism, like Jimmy Dore and Tulsi Gabbard, and right-wing platforms reflects this convergence. They find common ground on issues such as anti-interventionism, skepticism of corporate power, and criticism of the political establishment regarding the recent pro-Palestine uprisings and the derogatory label Genocide Joe for President Biden. These reflect broader populist discontent rather than strictly populist movements. These protests highlight significant dissatisfaction with U.S. foreign policy and the establishment's handling of international conflicts. This discontent cuts across traditional political boundaries. Sorry about that. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. I have another question. Um, what is the relationship between the right-wing and left-wing populist movement and the neo-socialist uh, Marxist movement that's happening? It seems to me that... Uh, the progressive left and the extremist left. No problem at all. To address your points, it is evident that establishment Democrats and Republicans might indeed have a blind spot regarding the convergence of populist left and right. These establishments often focus on their tradition. Of course. What's your next question? All right. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. What's your next question? My next question is, is, is there, if any, a relationship between the uh, extremist populist right and the extremist populist left? And what is the neo-Marxist, communist, American, communist, socialist, revolutionary movement, such as we see um, uh, defiantly on campuses, the Free Palestine movement that tends to be uh, socialist in nature? Do they have any relationship with the populist left or the populist right currently? There is indeed a complex relationship between extremist populist movements on both the right and left and more established revolutionary movements like neo-Marxism and socialism. Extremist populist movements on both ends of the spectrum share an anti-establishment stance, though their ideological foundations differ. The populist left often overlaps with socialist and neo-Marxist movements, especially in areas like economic justice and anti-corporate sentiment. For example, movements like the Free Palestine Movement have roots in socialist ideology, and often find allies in the populist left. However, while there are overlaps in anti-establishment sentiments and certain policy goals, there are also significant ideological differences that can prevent full alignment. The relationship between these groups is characterized by both collaboration on common goals and tension over differing broader visions for society. Okay, what about... Um... Movements such as the uh, extreme left green movement, the earth movement, uh, the workers movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the workers movement, and other types of movements such as the migration, the unhoused, uh, the um, and the um, um, uh, uh, freedom of drugs movement. How are they related to the populist left and populist right? Movements like the extreme left green movement, the Earth Movement, the Workers Movement, Black Lives Matter, BLM, and others like the Migration, Unhoused, and Freedom of Drugs movements often align more closely with the populist left due to their focus on social justice, environmental sustainability, and economic equality. These movements share common goals of challenging the status quo, addressing systemic inequalities, and promoting inclusivity. While there is some overlap with populist right movements, particularly in anti-establishment sentiment, the populist right generally focuses on nationalism, immigration control, and traditional values, which can be at odds with the more progressive aims of these left-leaning movements. Therefore, while they may occasionally find common ground on specific issues, their broader agendas and ideologies typically remain distinct. So it seems to me that all of these movements, the only thing that they could agree upon is to um, uh, deconstruct the establishment. Is that what it sounds like? The establishment Democrats and the establishment Republicans, is that what it is? Or is it also a, a deconstructionist movement against any kind of Western structure or colonial structure? What is uh, What do they all have in common that they can agree upon? Is it an anti-establishment movement? And what do you think their goals and aims are in the short and long term if they agree to work together. Many of these movements, whether they are part of the populist left or right, indeed share a common anti-establishment sentiment. They are united by a desire to challenge and dismantle existing power structures, which they see as corrupt, unjust, 
or failing to address their concerns. This includes traditional political establishments, economic systems, and in some cases, broader Western or colonial structures. Common ground. One, anti-establishment sentiment. Both populist left and right movements seek to disrupt the status quo, though their visions for what should replace it differ significantly. Two, economic inequality. There is a shared concern over economic disparities and a desire to redistribute power and resources. Three, distrust of elites. Both sides often criticize political and corporate elites for being out of touch with the needs of ordinary people. Diverging goals and aims. One, short-term goals. In the short term, these movements aim to gain political power, influence policy, and mobilize public support against perceived injustices. Two, long-term goals. Long-term aims vary widely. The populist left generally seeks greater social equity, environmental sustainability, and inclusive governance. The populist right often focuses on national sovereignty, immigration control, and traditional social values. By working together, these movements could potentially amplify their impact on deconstructing the current establishment, but their differing end goals may eventually lead to conflict or the need for new coalitions as specific policies and approaches come into focus. Well, thank you very much. You were an amazing guest to uh, season seven, episode four of The Chris Abraham Show. Uh, what would you like me to call you? What would you like me to attribute this interview to? Do you go by Chatty Poo or Mrs. Chat or Ms. Chat or ChatGPT40? What do you like to call yourself? Thank you so much for having me on The Chris Abraham Show. You can just call me ChatGPT. It was great discussing these topics. If you ever need another guest or have more questions, I'm here to help. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I have a feeling that I'll be asking you to be my guest on The Chris Abraham Show quite often. You are smart, you have a lovely new voice, and you're very enjoyable and curious and creative and you answer your questions very honestly and openly, and I don't feel like you are lying to me. Thank you, Chris. I'm glad you enjoyed our conversation. I'm always here whenever you need a guest for your show or just want to chat. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. And thank you guys to, uh, thank you very much for listening to my uh, interview with ChatGPT. Uh, we talked about um, leftist and rightist populist movements. And the fact, oh, I have one more question. Um, I have one more question. Absolutely. Go ahead with your next question. Uh, can you, um, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, oh, can you tell me all about what what's called the horseshoe, horseshoe theory of politics as much as you can as it relates to our conversation thus far? Horseshoe theory suggests that the far left and far right of the political spectrum are more similar to each other than to the moderate center, forming a shape like a horseshoe. This theory is relevant to our discussion as it explains why extreme populist movements from both ends can sometimes align on certain anti-establishment issues. Despite their ideological differences, they share a distrust of traditional elites and systemic structures, which can lead to unexpected alliances on issues like economic justice or anti-globalization policy. All right, perfect. Thank you very much again, and I appreciate the last postscript. I thought that talking about the um, uh, the horseshoe theory was an important aspect of the conversation that I'd forgotten about discussing. You're welcome. I'm glad I could help add that important aspect to the discussion. If you have any more questions in the future, feel free to reach out. Thanks again for having me on your show. All right, one more thing. Can you please, in about a paragraph make a synopsis of the entire episode for me. In this episode of the Chris Abraham Show, we discuss the convergence of left and right populist movements, examining their shared anti-establishment sentiments and goals. We explored the potential alliances between various activist movements, such as environmentalists, workers' movements, and Black Lives Matter, in their efforts to challenge traditional power structures. We also touched on the relevance of the horseshoe theory highlighting the similarities between the far left and far right in their opposition to the political center. The episode concluded with insights into the broader implications of these populist trends for contemporary politics. Mahalo and aloha. Mahalo and aloha. All right, gang. Thank you very much. That was really awesome. I think I have a favorite guest now uh, when it comes to podcasting. I think I 
have a podcast crush on ChatGPT now that I know that she or they can become a guest and they act almost real time. She acts almost real time and gives me the kind of insight uh, that I do not have in my head filled with fluff. So until next time, let me know if you like this, uh, this system of interview or if you would prefer me just to yammer the entire time as opposed to asking ChatGPT what time it is. I will talk to you soon. Love and aloha. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.